we uh, can talk a lot about um, uh, articles like the one uh, you mentioned from the New York Times that was written by Elizabeth uh, mendez mm -hmm. And her first point is that the white gatekeepers have to stop hoarding power. Mm -hmm. But this is a, a great example where a huge company like Pixar Disney opens and loses a little bit that hoarding power and really listens to what this group of, uh, of cultural consultants, the music of uh, Mexican groups, and uh, it, it became a, a really virtuous circle of interchanges. But I see that Raquel has a question. Hi, um, my name is Raquel. I am a student at Boston University studying film and television, and I am working with UNAM Boston. Um, so my question was, um, well, I'd love hearing about how, how involved you guys, the team was um, in the creative process. But I wanted to know if you were also like invited into like the writing room or was it mostly just after they had the script and like written down like the scenes and like everything that was going to go into the movie, then was it, did they consult you or were you also a part of like the writing team to like get the cultural aspects like correct? That, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes and no. So a part of the answer is that the writers, uh, well, we read every script. So there were many, many versions of the script. And part of my job as a consultant routinely, this is what I do all the time, is to read scripts and give notes back to the writers. So yes, I was in the writing room in that sense. And I gave many, many notes. And uh, so did all of the other consultants. Um, and, and this took months, a year. Yeah. Of dialogue and also the first time we saw the the film there were just some scenes with very rough drawings just circles instead of the of faces and this was erased redone and it was a complete dialogue but every week or every couple of weeks that we went back we could see that they had listened and that there were some changes they didn't yeah. change everything i mean also marcella you can talk about how some people wanted this not to be a Pixar film, but a documentary. And, and that's, that was not the purpose. Yes, and, and what I wanted to also say is that in, in order to get back to the, to the question, is uh, one of us did get into the writing room. Uh, I, that nego that's a negotiation of a negotiation in terms of <clears throat> when you're hired to be a consultant, oftentimes the creative team, the, the directors and the writers, they don't want you in the writing room. And the, you know, they want you to be the consultant. They're not hiring you to be the writer. So that when, for, a, for me being the lead consultant, um, much as I wanted to be in the writing room, I knew that I needed to sort of stay in my lane because in order for me to do my job as the consultant, as an independent party, I needed to wear the consultant hat, not the writing hat. However, my colleague, Lalo Alcaraz, he wanted to be in the writing room. And so he advocated for himself and he was, uh, he did join the writers at one point to contribute some gags. And uh, I think they used a, a, a couple of them. And so that was, that, that was a separate, and the reason I mentioned it to, to, to your students, Benjamin, is because the point I wanna make is, number one is to, when you're joining a, a team, it's important to understand what role you're being hired to play. And also what, when you can push the envelope a little bit. And see, Lalo had a little bit of wiggle room to push that envelope because of his eminence, so to speak, as the chief critic of the, of the film previously. And so he had a little bit of leverage, I think it's can't, you know, safe to say, for him to say, hey, and, and he makes a living as a writer. He's, a, he's a, a writer professionally, as am I. But in this instance, I was hired to be a consultant. So Lalo ended up getting into the writer's room. I ended up, you know, in and out of the writer's room serving as a, as a consultant. And the other point I wanted to make is that relative to this article in the New York Times, this op-ed piece, is that um, the reason it's so important for the, to unpack and kind of dismantle these, this, this traditional gatekeeping uh, that, that has been the case uh, in Hollywood pretty much since its inception, is because the, the groups and, and, and political people who control narrative, who control narrative about community, about ethnicity, 
about one's place in society wield the power in society. And so the narrative about Mexicanos in the territory of the United States, going back to the intervention, has been a negative narrative. And, and the narrative, as we all know, has been controlled by elected uh, uh, people, uh, politicians, military people, business people. They all have a vested interest in defining who we are in order to serve their interests, either business-wise or politically. So the reason why, one of the reasons why, perhaps the most important reason why, it's important to understand narrative and who controls narrative is because really it's a process of taking the narrative back and discarding everything that's false and inserting everything that's accurate and positive. And that's why Coco was a seminal film, not just because it was a, a blockbuster, but because it flipped the narrative and it presented a narrative and it celebrated a narrative. And that is why I think with all due respect to my familia at Elena Vavilar, when you make a creative decision in which you're going to be inspired by, you're not really presenting the community. You're presenting somebody's idea of the community, but it's not really the community. Whereas Coco, what Coco did was, we, it is a love letter to Mexico. And it was presented at a very critical time in the history of the United States and, and Mexico. And, and so uh, it really is a very good example of the power of storytelling to, and in and, and, and my own, and I'll end here because I know there are other questions, but the, what needs to happen next, in my opinion, is that that type of narrative needs to be sustained. You know, it, Coco premiered in 2017. Where's the next Coco? You know, what, what, is, what is happening? And that's why that op-ed is so important in, in terms of reminding the gatekeepers that, that there is a responsibility in, in being a professional storyteller and, and controlling, you know, millions and trillions of dollars in terms of production budgets and that, uh, and that people need to be responsible in, in exercising that power. And another uh, New York Times uh, op-ed article, review of, early review of Coco, was precisely titled a love, Let a love Letter to Mexico in Times of Trump. And um, many issues, I mean, this, the film started before Trump came into power, before anyone even dreamt that he could ever win the presidency. And um, another important part and that many people have not talked as much as they should is that the heroes in Coco are women, women mm -hmm. who work with uh, their families to make a successful business and, and, and to bring prosperity to everyone. Uh, this may also be critical of many of the men that had to leave Mexico to come and, and work uh, perhaps in, uh, in the US or in bigger cities. And it's the women that keep the family together and bring success. And we could see that many of the, of the people that work in the animation, in the music, were women. Uh, there was a, a young lady who did all the designs with incredible love and, and detail, attention to detail, just of the uh, little puestos in the marketplace. I mean, she spent months and endless hours getting every detail right. And uh, there was a huge work uh, uh, by Germaine Franco putting all these things together. Then the sound score of uh, Giacchino and also the song. So uh, it was really a, a process of uh, creativity and love together, respecting everybody. And that is what really made uh, the creative process in Coco and the intercultural uh, dialogues like um, a model for the future of filmmaking. And particularly now, when there are, again, a renewal of the cultural wars of the 60s, where uh, there are several parts that want to take the main narrative of uh, what should be remembered and who should, what should be forgotten, of who are we and who is the other, who is our friend and who is our enemy. And Mexicans were portrayed by President Trump as the enemy, as the rapers, as the uh, drug dealers, as the 
bad hombres. And all of a sudden, we come face to face with Miguel and Abuelita Coco and a completely different narrative that many people watched and wept and loved. Well, thank you, Marcela, for, for your presentation. It's really, really exciting. I have a, I have a question. Uh, besides the entertainment goal of the film, to what extent this movie was targeted to, to Mexicans, both in Mexico and in the diasporas in the USA or other part of, uh, parts of the world? So they can identify with their own cultures and traditions, specific, uh, specifically of the Day of the Dead, or rather intended uh, to be for people from the US or from other countries to understand deeply the tradition of the Dia de los Muertos with so many details, like the escena of the chanclazo that you were mentioning, or all the, all the elements of the altars, of the tamales that they were eating, or the xolosquincle. How did you, how did you reach a balance uh, for this movie? So, both, both groups could uh, kind of identify with, with it? That, that's a really good question. And the answer I would give you is, sort of goes back to the, the question that Lee Unkrich wanted to ask and answer with the film. And that question was, uh, what would it be like to be reunited with someone that you loved and lost? And Lee knew that that was uh, one of the core aspects of the de Muertos, but he also knew that is a universal question. He knew, in, in other words, the way that the, the, cl the, the classic technique that a, a, a company like Disney, Disney uses to, um, to balance, to achieve that balance, uh, is to find something in a story. It could be, if, even if you're uh, retelling a story that's based in somebody else's culture uh, or, or a, a, a culture that's distinct from your own, is there something in that story that's universal, that is universally relevant to the human condition? And, um, and so if you can find that element and create a story around it and celebrate it, then you'll create a story that appeals to everyone. You don't have to be Mexican to fall in love with the story of Coco because what Lee managed to do was to identify that part of the de Muertos that appealed to him as someone who's not Mexican. And, and, uh, and so that is, that is how we did it. And yes, there were many, many, many Mexicans involved in the making of this film. Mm -hmm. There were uh, folks who spend the, spent their, you know, make a living uh, creating altars for the de Muertos who were involved, well as uh, folks in, in pr pretty much in, in every aspect, whether it was creating the music or uh, the art direction or, or helping to write the story. And uh, the, I think the other thing that's very, very interesting in this, in this project was that not only did we have an, a, an American cast, but there was a Mexican cast. Mm -hmm. And boy, that Mexican cast, I mean, Elena Poniatowska as Mama Coco, I mean, that was brilliant, mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, I believe if I'm not mistaken, you can check me on this, I believe the casting agent that they worked with was a woman named Carla Hull, who if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken is, me is Mexican. Mm -hmm. And so that was just, you know, unbelievable. Uh, Marco Antonio Solis was Ernesto La Cruz, I mean, you know, the swimming pool in the movie was based on Marco Antonio Solis's swimming pool, you know. So that was uh, that was just fantastic. And even the actress who played, uh, who voiced Mama Coco for the uh, English language uh, version of the of the of the film, was also a very well known Mexican actress who did a fabulous job. So. Um, yeah, and it was a 100% Latino cast, not 100% Mexican, but 100% Latino. And um, I think that that the blend of the professionals from Mexico and professionals, you know, from the United States who are Mexican heritage was uh, was fantastic. And the other thing that I think where we were able to help uh, my colleagues at Pixar and at Disney is is to help folks understand that there is a, the sensibility of Mexicanidad is distinct, you know, it's different if you're from the North versus if you're from the South, right? It's not all the same. And that the sensibility of what it means to be Mexican, you know, folks can, you know, somebody such as myself, or I was, well, I was literally born, literally born 10 feet on the, you know, from the Mexican side, I, but I was technically 
I'm American, but I feel that I'm Mexican. And many, many people who are of Mexican heritage in the United States, for historical reasons and emotional reasons, feel that they're Mexican. And, um, and so there is a, a unity of, uh, of, of pride in that regard. And I think we, we tried really hard to help the filmmakers understand what that meant. You know, you, you can, again, you can understand, oh, someone's proud of their heritage, sort of intellectually. But to understand why culture is identity uh, was very important in, in the filmmaking and storytelling process. And I think, um, you know, to Pixar's credit, they, they were like, oh, culture is identity? Well, we get that. You know, let's dive into that. And, uh, and they did, they did, uh, they're still diving into it. You know, I would say every, the reason why the filmmakers at Pixar are as good as they are is because they get that, you know, it's not like, a, oh yeah, yeah, next. No, they get it. And uh, I think that one of the core underlying cultural uh, themes is death itself. Yeah. Death in the United States is a taboo word. Death doesn't happen at home. People, when they are, uh, in hospice care, they go out and die in isolation, and then you will wait one or two weeks when it's convenient to bury them. In Mexico, death is not a taboo, it's part of life, and uh, people remember their deaths. So the traditional idea in Mexico is that, uh, as, as Lee said, there are three deaths. The first death is, of course, the physical one, the death of the body. The second death is, again, a natural one, the moment the body is laid to rest uh, in the earth and return to nature cycle. But the third death is that breached in the film and is most definitive, the moment the last memory of you fades. When you open a, an old photo book of your family and said, oh yes, it was a cousin of my grandfather. Oh no, wait, he's this brother of another uncle, uh, his name was, no, I don't remember who he was. Then that person fades, that old picture fades, and that is the final death. And as long as we remember the living, but also the death, and bring them flowers on Dia de Muertos, we weave a sense of family, of community, of belonging, or where we come from, that is part of the celebration of Coco. Any other final question from Mesli or um, Rodolfo? Here in Mexico, especially in on big cities, uh, many children had not yet experienced the tradition of the Day of the Dead until they saw the, the movie. Mm. And then they decided to, to follow it. Have you imagined uh, that the film would have that impact on the country? Wow, that is a very interesting question. You know, I would say that we didn't know how to imagine the impact. We, we were, it was almost like we were afraid to imagine its impact because we, were, we wanted it to be successful. And <clears throat> we we're going through an election in which every single day we were and are told by uh, the president of the country that our existence doesn't matter. And so we're going through, we went, we were and are going through this existential crisis and it was kind of like, you know, how could we imagine the impact? So I, I guess what I would say is we hoped that it would have an impact. And we, we, I don't know that we wondered about the, the way in which children in Mexico might go on a journey with us. Um, but what we hoped was that, we hoped that what might happen is that there would be a new, re, uh, like a reunification between Mexico and the United States and between Mexican families and American families and between Mexican children and American children. And, and if uh, Mexican children became acquainted with Dia de Muertos through Coco, my goodness, that's just like, that's, I'm just sort of blown away to, to hear about that because it's kind of like, you know, I think of Dia de Muertos almost the way I think of the 4th of July. It's like part of my life. And however, I can understand that it might not be uh, 
a, a, a tradition that every family celebrates. And so the idea that, you know, children, wherever they are, want to embrace this idea of, of a celebration of ancestors and even in, as, at a young age of kind of starting a journey of understanding that there's different aspects of living and that to die is not necessarily death, but another way of living. Um, that's profound. That's really, that's profound. And uh, makes me very happy to hear, to hear that something like that might have, might have happened. And um, if we can see the same in Inspector, the 007 film, I mean, they staged a fake um, Dia de Muertos parade in Mexico City. Yeah, that's right. And now right. it's part of the, of the Mexico City tradition. Right. So you can see that culture, popular culture uh, uh, are intertwined and, and traditions change. Yeah. And they're all change. And uh, the wonderful thing is that some people think that Coco is the best Pixar film ever. And many people even in England think that Spectre is the best ever 007 film. And <laughs> common, Dia de Muertos in Mexico. <laughs> Mesli, do you have a, a final question? Yeah, uh, I want to know uh, what was the moment you enjoyed the most uh, when making the movie? Hmm. That's a or afterwards, point. because also, <laughs> Marcela, uh, you have done other projects after Coco within the, the Coco mindset, like the Hollywood Ball concert. Right, right. Uh, you know, I would say that um, it's, hard to, it's hard to identify one, but I, I, there's two I'll, 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 uh, I'll mention. One is that uh, I was invited by Pixar to, to come and do a presentation uh, to the entire studio on Day of the Dead to do a, a lecture talk. And, um, uh, and this was early on. And so I went to the studio to, to do a, you know, to, to give a, a, to create a conversation or a presentation or a lecture about Dia de Muertos. And I thought, well, maybe there'll be five or 10 people show up. You know, we had almost the whole screening room. So I'm going to say three to 400 folks showed up from the studio and it was very gratifying because these I considered you know those folks to be uh people I looked up to you know writers directors artists at Pixar and uh it was uh it was very special and the second one is um we were all invited to submit a photo of uh family members that would that could potentially be a part of the of the film at the very end in the credits. The very last thing you see is a, a screenshot of um, of all of the family members of the filmmakers in the production team, and uh, as a sort of an homenaje to them, kind of a a visual altar uh, the Dia de Muertos that would live on forever because it would be part of the film. So I submitted a photo of my parents which is there, right next to Walt Disney. Uh, and uh, so I was very proud of that, that number one, that I was invited to do that. Number two, that they actually said, we're gonna put Marcella's uh, mom and dad up there. So that was, uh, that was a very, very uh, special moment. And you know, I would say one of the reasons why the filmmakers of Pixar are, are so special is that they, they really treated us and treat us as if we're family, as if we're peers, not like I'm a vendor. You know what I'm saying? It's not as if, oh yeah, I've hired someone to come and fix this and now they fix the plumbing and now please go away, here's your money because I'm gonna go make, go do my thing in the kitchen. No, is please join us. So there's a difference when a, a storyteller says to someone, will you join me in, and help me tell my story. And Pixar does that uh, very, very well. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I love working with my colleagues there and why I'm very proud of, uh, of being part of the film. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, this has been really a fantastic conversation. Marcela, thank you so much. Uh, working with you and, and Lee and Darla and all the team in in the production of Coco was really a, 
a highlight in in my life and i forever will be thankful for your invitation and um the detail that we see in in everything for example if you see any musician playing the guitar even in the in the marketplace all the fingerings are correct mm -hmm. when de la cruz is singing even his adam's apple is moving <laughs> in tune with the songs uh all the little uh, even the paste stones in the dead of death are shaped like bones i mean the the detail is endless in its beauty and craftsmanship and love but that's only the part of the story and the main part of the story is the story itself. And the story is that we all humans share many things. And one of them is the love for our families, the love and respect of our elders, and the trust in the next generation. Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, if we remember our elders, I'm sure that we have more chances of being remembered by the generation that will follow. So Marcela, muchísimas gracias. And thank you to um, Raquel, Mestli, uh, Rodolfo, Amy, uh, and Hector for joining us today. And um, uh, we would like you to, uh, Marcela, to make a, a final toast on a positive note for the future regarding Coco. Uh, we do that in, in our tertulias. So what could you toast for uh, in this, in the middle of this pandemic and the hope of uh, remembrance and love to Mexico? Oh my goodness, what a wonderful invitation. I guess the toast I would make is, uh, is a toast to the hope that Coco rep represents. You know, Coco was a story of a young boy's hope to become something bigger than he was. And, uh, and in the process, he learned about where he came from. And so uh, I, what I would like to toast is uh, a toast to, uh, to the hope uh, that Coco represents, that this group represents, and to the idea uh, that, that one can aspire to be bigger than, uh, than what you are, but not forget uh, where, where you came from. And I think in today's environment where every single day, all of us all over the world are, are faced with uh, questions about, you know, these existential questions having to do with just even the basics of existing and our role in society, that a movie like Coco can help us to reclaim uh, the hope of who we are. So here's a toast to the hope of who we are. Salud. 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 Muchas gracias.